And so we're very glad to have Jonathan Kirby here today from the University of East Anglia, who will be talking about a model theoretic look at exponential fields. So you can start when you're ready, Jonathan. Thank you very much. It's a, a great pleasure to be invited here. I feel like uh, maybe 20 years ago, um, I might have gone in the direction of, of um, categories and, and um, uh, even accessible categories. Um, and then fate took me in a different direction. Um, but maybe um, I'll, I'll try and indicate a little bit about how uh, model theory could look a little bit towards accessible categories. Um, again, as I suppose it, it, it sort of diverged at some point uh, uh, a long time ago. Um, so I'm not entirely sure um, of the background of everyone in the audience. So if I get this wrong, um, please, please, please ask questions. I'm very happy for this to be a dialogue uh, rather than a, just a, a, a lecture. Uh, so I tried to explain um, where I'm coming from. And um, so let me move on to the, to the outline of the talk. So um, <clears throat> I'm gonna start by saying something about what model theory is, or at least one, what one perspective on model theory is. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, existentially closed models uh, and how this relates to positive logic, which is actually the same thing as coherent logic. Um, and then I'll talk about uh, existentially closed uh, exponential fields. So this is somehow the, the application that I'm, I'm going to talk about is exponential fields. And I'll try and link that into the sort of general discussion of how model theory is looking, uh, or part of model theory is looking to, to move in a more general uh, way, sort of towards categorical logic in some respects. Uh, so we'll start with, um, yeah, traditional model theory. So here's one um, idea about what model theory is. So we'll start with the example. We take um, the theory of vector spaces with scalars in the, in the real field. So we all know what that is. We know we can write down axioms for that. And um, we can formalize that in a first order language where we have um, a binary function symbol for addition, uh, a constant for zero, and for every real number, we'll take a unary function symbol um, and that which we'll call lambda times, whatever. So if we do this, um, then we can, we can formalize these axioms of, of real vector spaces. If we add an axiom saying that there's a non-zero element, so we rule out the, the zero dimensional vector space, then all the vector spaces we get are infinite and and we can prove that this theory is actually complete. And completeness for a first order theory, so this is an important property for model theorists, um, means that every sentence of the language or its negation is a consequence of the axioms. Okay, so what else would a model theorist do after that? Um, so we want to understand what the models are. Well, that's easy, they're vector spaces. That's sort of what we started with. Uh, we want to know what elementary embeddings are. So these are the embeddings of models of our theory, which preserve all of the information that the theory uh, knows. Uh, and in this case, that's just all embeddings of vector spaces. Um, we want to know what definable subsets are. So if you take any model, you take a, a Cartesian power of that model, um, you have a formula with whatever, or n free variables, that defines a subset. We want to know, well, what are those subsets? And in this case, uh, it's translates of subspaces and also any finite Boolean combination of, of, of these things. And we also want, model theorists also want to know what types are. So this is the, the model theoretic notion of type. So it's the set of, so the type of an element is the set of all formulas true of that element or finite tuple. So you want to know what those things are as well. And, and in this case, once you understand the definable sets, you can understand the types as well. Okay, so that's one example. Um, I guess that will be familiar to anyone who's done any model theory. Um, uh, another example, one might want to study fields. So 
let's think about the, the, the obvious fields. There's the complex field, the real field, and the rational field. So what do we do? Well, we take our language of rings. Uh, we can just write the axioms of fields that we're familiar with. And we can ask, well, what other axioms do we need to get a complete theory? And then we can think, well, well what are the other models? So you've got a field, you get its theory, then there'll be some other models by, by a compactness theorem. Um, and then you can ask about the definable sets as well. So I won't immediately answer that question. Um, and what I personally am interested in, what I do a lot of research on is the extra question, if you add the exponential function to the language, uh, not in the rational case, but in the, in the complex and the real cases, um, you take the, the, the usual exponential function um, defined by its usual power series. Uh, you add that to the language and you want to understand axioms for, uh, and behavior in, in, in that setting as well. So when we try and give an answer to what is traditional model theory, this is the sort of answer that Abraham Robinson might have given um, in the, I guess in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and someone like Tarski would have probably have given a, a very different answer. But what I would say is that model theory, you take some theory and it's usually a, a first order finitary theory in classical logic. And it's often described, you start with some sort of second order description. For example, the, th the, the theory of vector spaces, we, we, we probably start off with something which isn't the axioms in this formal first order logic. Um, and or this, the, you'd say it's the theory of a structure like the real field. So the theory of the real field, um, you have to give a second order description of what the real field is for this to be a description of a theory. You start with that and then you ask, well, can we write a complete axiomatization? What are the models? What are the elementary embeddings of models? Uh, what are the definable sets? So the tool we often have is, is quantifier elimination says that any formula is equivalent in the theory to one without quantifiers. If you can do that, then, um, then more or less you understand what the, what the, what the formulas are. Uh, and maybe you have to expand the language slightly before you can do that. And maybe you can't do it at all. And then what are the types? So these are the sort of, what I would say are the traditional questions in what, might, what you might call this applied model theory, because we're using model theory to study mathematical structures that we thought of for some other reason that, that arise for some other reason in mathematics. The next thing you might want to do um, is you might want to link this with Schellach's uh, ideas in model theory. So you want to ask, so this is sort of stability theory and you want to ask how combinatorially complicated that theory is. So it could be stable or unstable, it could be simple or not simple. And um, there's this very nice map by um, Gabriel Conant of, um, of, of all the, not all, but some of the different uh, complexity classes of, um, of, first, of complete first order theories. So um, I'm not going to go into this in any detail at all. I just want to show you that it exists. And um, there's a, you can, well, this is a website, it's an active website. So you can go and, and play around and, and see the different sections. And so it's a very nice website, but let me just indicate, so I've just got a screenshot of it here. Um, but this is the, what he calls the alpha quadrant. This is the stable part. So anything in here is stable, uh, which I won't define. Maybe you know what it means, maybe you don't. In here is uh, the, maybe the, the most nicely behaved bits of theor theories. And one of these is the algebraically closed fields. These are uh, very well behaved. Um, they have very low complexity of the, of the types, of the, of the sort of space of types or the, um, the structure of the definable sets. Um, so we're going to look at something which, so the algebraically closed fields turn out to be here. A real closed fields, so the real field turns out to be up here, which is not stable, but it's still quite simple, uh, not in the technical sense, but low complexity, O minimal. Uh, the real field with exponentiation turns out also to be up here, so it doesn't add any complexity. And the complex field, when you add exponentiation, it jumps from here 
into the delta quadrant and it's somewhere up here which is sort of maximal complexity so it does something quite different and we're also going to find an example which turns out to be in this box here so it's uh, it's more complicated than anything that's stable um, but it doesn't go in the direction of O minimal it goes in this direction of uh, towards simple and then NSOP1 so I haven't, I'm not going to explain much more, but uh, do ask questions if you want to ask, and please do go to this website and, and play around with it. Um, the, the link is on the slides, so um, if, we, if you want the link uh, later. Okay, let's jump back to answering the, the questions I had and the examples. So the complex field, um, the axioms we need are, are those of algebraically closed fields. Um, okay, um, and then it turns out that all embeddings between algebraically closed fields are the elementary ones. We do have full quantifier elimination, which means definable sets are just Boolean combinations of zero sets of polynomials. And we can say something more. We can say geometrically these correspond to complex algebraic varieties. So this is a way that you know, the first order theory connects with some other branch of mathematics, in this case, algebraic geometry. And then types correspond to generic points on varieties. So an algebraic geometer may, understands what this means. Um, model theorist understands what these things are. It turns out they're the same. Okay, the real field. Uh, well, this is maybe less well known, uh, but there are things called real closed fields. Um, actually, I'm curious. Uh, we got uh, can people can people let me know how, how many people know what a real closed field is, or at least have heard of such a thing. So anyone who's heard of such a thing? I'm not got, sure what uh, the best way to do this is. Can maybe you've, you've got? Can you, yeah, some people can say yes or put their thumbs up. Yes, you can say no if you don't know. <laughs> Okay, anyway, some people, yeah, okay, people, people have some idea, that's good. Okay, so it turns out that all the embeddings between these things are also elementary embeddings, we haven't lost anything there. Um, and we have quantify elimination, but not immediately, you have to add the order in, and you, but that's not a new thing, you can define that already with this one existential quantifier. And then geometrically, it turns, well, these things are, of course, they're very important things that you can define with, um, polynomials and inequalities, uh, these are called semi-algebraic sets. So there's another connection between um, the, 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 model theory, the model theoretic analysis of this case captures something which is already known, semi-algebraic geometry. And um, when we're asked what are types, so this is a little bit more complicated than in the, the complex case, but the types are, at least in one variable, they're related to Dedekind cuts uh, and also to infinitesimals. So they're not quite Dedekind cuts. Okay, so in each case, um, it turns out that what you get uh, is the theory of the class of existentially closed models of something. So I'll explain more what this is um, in a minute. But if you start here, instead of the complex field, you just start with the axioms for fields and you can sort of throw in as much as you can, try and build a bigger and bigger model, which um, a bigger and bigger field, which solves whatever equations and inequations you want. You end up with this existentially closed thing, which is algebraically closed fields. And in this case, instead of starting with this real field, you start with just the notion of an ordered field. You do the same thing. You throw in as many solutions to equations and inequations as you can, provided you keep being an ordered field, and you end up with a notion of a real closed field. So this is the idea of existentially closed um, model. <clears throat> okay, so let me jump to a quick advertisement. So I wrote a book. This is really an undergraduate textbook um, about this sort of approach to model theory. Um, so this is where you can you can read more about this sort of uh, this sort of world. Okay, let me move on. So I want to talk about exponential fields. 
So remember I said an exponential field is a field, it's going to have characteristic zero, and we equip it with some homomorphism from its additive group to its multiplicative group. I guess uh, maybe this notation isn't familiar. So I just mean some exp, uh, some map x such that exp of x plus y equals exp of x times exp of y. Okay, so this, this thing here is the multiplicative group that corresponds to multiplication. This is the additive group which corresponds to addition. So maybe I didn't do, need to use that um, notation, but there it is. So we need this and we also need, I guess, that x of zero is one. So we don't have the trivial map which sends everything to zero. So the examples that, that I mentioned before, we've got the real exponential field here. So it's the reals with its usual exponentiation. The kernel of that exponential map is just trivial. It's just zero. And the complex exponential map and the kernel there is two pi i times the integers. So this difference uh, turns out to be crucial for the, for the theory, the two theories of the, of the two structures. So in the real case, this is now reasonably well understood. So um, Alex Wilkie proved uh, in, well, he's published in 1996, that the theory of this is model complete, which means it has quantifier elimination, not completely, but down to the level of existential formulas. So every formula is equivalent to an existential formula. And its negation is also equivalent to an existential formula. So it's not just Boolean combinations of existential formulas, but actually existential formulas. Uh, it's also O minimal for people who know what that is. Um, this tameness uh, property for the definable sets. And uh, from this model completeness, it follows that it has an axiomatization in, term, uh, in terms of AE sentences. So, uh, well, you just take all the AE sentences which are true of that, um, that here, and, and that's an axiomatization. It's not necessarily, well, it's not a practical axiomatization. So we haven't got a practical axiomatization um, and it may not exist. So another theorem uh, from the same, well, published the same year by Angus McIntyre and Alex Wilkie um, says, well, if Shannell's conjecture of transcendental number theory is true, I won't explain this, but it's a, it's a, it's a difficult, uh, well, so completely out of reach conjecture. So it's, for example, it, it follows that E is transcendental, which we know, and we know that pi is transcendental, that, that also follows. But the sort of the next simplest application would be that E and pi are algebraically independent. So they don't satisfy any polynomial uh, in two variables uh, with integer coefficients. Uh, and that's an open question. And um, this Shannell's conjecture is, is about all possible polynomial uh, combinations of, um, of, well, integers and exponentials of integers and rationals and anything you can define <coughs> um, this sort of way. And it's, um, it's completely hopeless, it seems. But anyway, we can assume it's true. Um, and then it turns out that the theory has a recursive axiomatization. So in principle, it's decidable. But um, yeah, if, if Shell's conjecture is, well, I mean, and I think their theory so well. If you if you know that there are five counterexamples to Shannon's conjecture, and these are the these are the, these are the counterexamples, then you also get a recursive axiomatization. But if the Shannon's conjecture fails badly, then I think they show that it it actually doesn't have a recur recursive axiomatization. So part of our um, part of what we think model theory, what I said model theory is about, wouldn't work anymore. But we still know well. This is still a big theorem. It has um, major applications in um, number theory and uh, lots of mathematics. Okay, so let me talk about the complex field. So this is a different setup um, because the ring of integers is definable. So Z is an integer. If we take a complex number of Z, then it's an integer if and only if, um, uh, okay, so this, this F should be the complex exponential field. So in the complex exponential field, um, whenever 
x is uh, in the kernel of exponentiation, then z times x is also in the kernel of exponentiation. So um, shouldn't take too much to, to see that. Let's just correct this. Let's see x there. Okay, so certainly if, well, x is something like, well, x must be two pi i times an integer. If we multiply that by an integer, we still get two pi i times an integer. So, so that's right. And you can, the, the other direction is easy too. But that means that the, the integers as a ring, well, we know that Gödel's phenomenon uh, applies. So the complete theory is, is not decidable and well, it's uh, for model theoretically, it's sort of worse than that. I mean, also you've got no control over definable sets or no control of the complexity. It's, sort of, it's very bad. So it's not a tame theory in the sense of this sort of higher stability hierarchy I, I showed. So this is sort of the end of the story when it comes to this classical first order model theory, uh, at least for, for my talk. Um, but Zilber had a, another idea, which is you can still study this model theoretically, this complex exponential field, uh, sort of algebraically, model theoretically. Uh, and well, we'll assume the sort of channel conjec channels conjecture or anything else we, we sort of need. Uh, and then maybe we can come back and, and get rid of these assumptions later. Um, so he built something as another exponential field in the sense of a field with a homomorphism like this. And conjecturally, it's isomorphic to the complex one. But this conjecture is hard because it includes channels conjecture. So, um, but at least what I can tell you is it's not known to be false. So, uh, I mean, it's a non trivial thing to produce a, um, an a given algebraic construction which. Uh, uh, of, a, of an exponential field, which you can't show by any analytic means uh, is different from this one. Uh, I mean, of course, in practice, we can't do it. We don't, maybe they're not um, isomorphic. And he gave a list of axioms and it's not, they're not first order axioms, they're axioms in, in this logic here. So this uh, L omega uh, one omega is like the usual first order classical logic, except you're allowed uh, countable conjunctions in here uh, and, and countable disjunctions, but only finitely many um, free variables in a, in, a, in a formula. And this Q is a quantifier which says there exists uncountably many X such that something. So this, is, this takes you a little bit out of this L infinity omega hierarchy, but uh, this is, this is needed. And um, the, the, the great thing about this sentence is it has exactly one model of each infinite cardinality. And this BX is then the, the one of cardinality continuum. So we've got a description of this BX. So the point is that this, this ax these axioms actually are what is used to define the structure. So, um, um, so we need this infinitary logic to do that. Okay, I feel I've been going on for a long time. Have, has anyone got any questions uh, about anything I've, I've said so far? Am I going too fast or am I going in the wrong direction? Am I going I, too slowly? I think it's going okay. If, if anyone does have any questions, just feel free to unmute yourselves and ask one. Uh, any comments? Okay. Yeah, please do. Okay. So let's move on to this is uh, the next chat section. I want to talk a little bit about existentially closed models. And this is where we um, go towards the, uh, the category theoretic uh, categorical logic. So <clears throat> recall if or or prove quickly for yourself if you don't recall that a theory T is inductive. Uh, so this is a definition of the union of chains, if the union of a chain of models is a model, and that's if and only if the, the class of models or the category of models, let's say the category of models uh, with embeddings 
is closed under co-limits of directed systems. And that's if and only if T is axiomatized by um, AE sentences. Okay, so this is, this is a useful um, equ equivalence. And what we say is our model uh, M of a theory T is existentially closed. If whenever we have a quantifier free formula in two sets of variables here, phi of xy, and, uh, and for all uh, A in, in M, in the original model, if what we want to do is we want to solve this, we think of this as a system of equations or equations in equations or something like this, which is quantifier free formula. We want to solve that in an extension, right? So suppose we can solve that in extension, right? So there is in this some bigger model, some extension, some bigger model, um, we've got some X such that phi of X A holds. Right, so M is existentially closed if whenever you can do that in extension, you can already do it in your original M. Okay, so that this is the, the idea. So an important example here, this is just what I was talking about earlier, algebraically closed fields are precisely this. And the real closed ordered fields are precisely these, um, the real closed fields. Uh, so these are precisely existentially closed models of the theories of fields and of ordered fields. Okay. And a trivial lemma really. So if you take any inductive theory and you take any model of the T, you can find uh, an existentially closed model containing A. And you just build it as a, you just, you want to solve an equation, you go to a bigger model, you solve it. You want to solve an equation there, you, you just build it as a chain. So there's, that's trivial proof. Okay, so this is uh, what existentially closed models are. And the th one can actually just work with the category of existentially closed models. The thing is, these existentially closed models um, the collection of them may not be axiomatized as a first order theory. So in these two cases, it is, but generally it isn't. Um, but already um, Abraham Robinson was, was, was working with these and in Wilfred Hodge's book on model theory from, well, published in the early nineties, but will be written sometime before that, um, he discusses these things. So, uh, I'm not sure how useful this slide is actually. I did originally write this for a talk to model theorists. So um, maybe, I, maybe I will skip over this and just say that there are good analogs between the sort of things we do in model theory classically. And in fact, we can do them still in this class of existentially closed models. Um, so, I mean, the sort of models correspond, we now think about existentially closed models. So this, this, this was a complete theory T. This T prime is no longer complete. It's, it's an inductive theory, but instead of a model of that complete theory, we're just looking at an existentially closed model. So is this sort of analog? Elementary embeddings get replaced by just embeddings. Um, but I will, yeah, I think the rest of it I'll skip over. But um, uh, I do want to, point out some as a sort of technical point that if you take your theory that you start with, any theory, first order theory, you can do a process called morleization, which means that basically for every formula of the language, you introduce a new relation symbol. And then you introduce axioms saying that the relation symbol does what it's supposed to do. And if you do that, everything becomes uh, quantifier free. And when you have quantifier free um, types and theories, whatever, if we have quantifier elimination, then actually um, these two things coincide. So the category of existentially models of an inductive theory is actually a more general setting, strictly more general setting than classical model theory. So it's not something weird that's just different, it's actually a proper generalization. So where are we going with this? Uh, I want to go to positive logic, which is a further generalization. And this is what you probably are more familiar with. 
uh, well, I guess, hopefully, in, in categorical logic. So we take a positive formula. We're not taking any first order formula. We're just using um, this syntax. So we're allowed uh, fulsome, the truth, and or, and the existential quantifiers. So they can put those in prenext normal form like this, uh, but we don't allow negation or implication. But then we have something which we're going to call an H inductive sentence. Uh, and it's a sentence of this form. So here we have an implication and a universal quantification. And here are these positive formulas. So it may look, uh, this looks very odd to a model theorist, certainly. The first time you see it, you think, well, we've just ruled out implication and universal quantification. Here you are, you've just put them back in again. So what's going on here? Um, but this is the, the critical point. So something of this form, a sentence of this form is exactly the thing uh, where the category of models of such a sentence is closed under co-limits of directed systems of homomorphisms. So that's, that's where this idea comes from. It's, um, it doesn't come from the syntax, it comes from the semantics. So the H is for homomorphism and H inductive theory is just this set of such sentences. So this is a proper generalization of these EC models because if we just take uh, a language where we have not equals as a as a predicate as a positive predicate and the and the, we need the axioms that say that that this symbol behaves like not equals so for all x y um, x can't be equal to y and not equal to y and uh, x is either equal to y or not equal to y then um, what you get is well that will that will force all your um, homomorphisms to be injective and then if you have um, you can also take formal negations of any basic relations so that will force your homomorphisms to be embeddings so if you do this you can basically take a theory and you build as much negation in as you like so it's a really nice generalization of, of classical logic can i just ask a question actually here homomorphism yeah. Homomorphism just means something which preserves the basic operations and relations as opposed to uh, elementary embedding or something. Does it, is That's that right. So if I take uh, two sort of L structures, structures in a yeah. language, a homomorphism is going to preserve the function symbols and preserve the basic relations, but not necessarily reflect them. Right. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, this, this, this business is, is what you can, is, is what forces you to reflect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Good question. Okay, so let me let me give a, a potted history, which um, <clears throat> so this thing, as I said, this is Abraham Robinson's approach to model theory from the 50s or 60s. Um, uh, Schellach did something similar in 1975. He defined and, and studied things called which he called kind two and kind three of theories. Um, uh, I guess these weren't supposed to be permanent names, they're just what he was calling them the paper. Um, Khrushchevsky rediscovered these, he called this kind three things Robinson theories. Um, and um, Hodges, I said, it, it, in, in these books, he, he describes this, this as well. Uh, Pillay wrote a paper in 2000 about this. Um, but mostly it hasn't, it, I think it, it hasn't got a lot of, it, it hasn't been very fashionable. Uh, positive logic, which is with these homomorphisms rather than just embeddings, um, is, well, I mean, it was defined in 2006 by Poisson and Itai ben Yaakov uh, did some more work with Poisson in 2007. Poisson has come back to it with someone else, uh, Yeshkeev. Two years or three years ago. Um, um, ben Yakov did some more work um, uh, in 2003. This is around his PhD thesis. He did some, so this simplicity is related to this Schellach uh, stability hierarchy, simple, not simple dichotomy. Um, and then uh, my co author, Levon uh, Heikashian, uh, wrote a paper. 
um, on spaces of types. And my PhD student who's here, uh, Mark Kamsma, has extended some of that work to think about type space functors. So it's pushing it more in the categorical uh, direction. Okay, so positive logic is the same as what any categorical logician would call coherent logic. And the presentation is slightly different. So instead of this H inductive sentence like this, uh, you might write it like this. So as a sequent, um, so the, the, the universal quantification is sort of understood and the, the free variables are written uh, somehow as a down here. At least this is notation from Peter Johnston's book. And of course it's older in this setup than, than the model theoretic discovery. So uh, the Topos notion of a Grotendieck Topos from the 60s, um, Lovier spotted a connection with logic in 73. Um, the connection with model theory was certainly made by Mackay and Reyes in 76. McLean and Murdoch have this exposition in, in their book in 94. Uh, and this obviously this part D of, of sketches of an elephant contains this, well, it's, it's, it's there, you can find it there. Um, so the, the dates here are definitely earlier than the dates in the, in the model theoretic literature. Uh, of course, the, the focus is different. Uh, what the focus in the model theory is to do with the Shellach work, um, but the basic theory, of course, is the same. There's also geometric logic. So it's similar to coherent, but you allow infinite disjunctions. And uh, in geometric logic, you can actually axiomatize these EC models of a coherent theory. So as I, as I said, you can't do this in first order logic necessarily, you, but sometimes, uh, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. But if you allow this geometric logic, you can always, um, you can always axiomatize the EC models. And in fact, this, is, this was rediscovered or, or known, I don't know, it's, it's Hodge's book gives this proof. So it's not, a, um, I, I have no idea, it's not very difficult. So he might have, it might have been rediscovered by model theorists um, or not, I'm not sure. Okay, and here are some sort of other ways in which these two, these two areas of mathematics ought to, ought to know more about each other, I think. So um, certainly model theorists don't know a lot of, this, but so we have the Gödel completeness theorem, um, and there's a Deligne completeness theorem, which just does the analog, um, more or less. I mean, you, you have to understand the analogy, but there it goes. The compactness theorem still works. This is sort of one of the things that um, people in, in model theory sort of think that this first order classical model theory is the only place where compactness works, but it, it, it's not true but you need to be careful because compactness theorem works in positive logic, but only for positive formulas. So, so you can't do everything with it. Um, uh, an important part of sort of underlying ideas in, in model theory is the stone space of, of types. This type space is the stone dual of the, the space of formulas, the, the, the Boolean algebra of formulas. And if you, well, one way to generalize that is to look at the, in coherent logic is to look at the spectral space of types. Uh, there are two different topologies you can put on this, on this but this is, this is um, this one is a dual topology, but um, I think this, this, this appears to be the, the most useful analog. Um, uh, one can do uh, interpretations, which Kamsma has done. There's notions of atomic models and emitting types, which is a standard thing in this. Well, Shellac's reduction is, is based on this. Um, and the stability hierarchy, uh, there are some th things. So this picture of the stability hierarchy I had from many slides ago, this one here. So this is for classical first order theories, complete theories. How much of this picture works for coherent logic? Well, we don't know exactly, but at least the stable dividing line we have and the simple one 
And this next one, NSOP1, I'll explain we also have that as well. So most of it probably works, but um, we don't know exactly. Now a category theorist is going to say that, look, what, what, what's a model? What are you thinking about? A model theorist, a model is a set with some structure on it. And the category in categorical logic, you want to take a model that's not, well, it's just an object in some other category. Um, you want to be allowed to do that. And this is not something that I know um, how to make use of particularly. So this, I would love it if people were um, uh, able to, to, to feed into this. But I think part of the problem is this, this notion of really needing to be quite close to a complete theory. So the theory doesn't necessarily have to be complete, but if it's very far from a complete theory, then the sort of model theoretic tools are not, uh, just don't apply. So, and if, you, if you're, you know, if, if you're not in a, at least a two valued Boolean topos, then um, your notion of complete theory isn't perhaps the right one. Okay, so that's the end of my second section. Uh, make sure I should I should pause again and ask uh, for if there are questions. Probably you will mention it later, but this positive logic is related to accessible categories, of course. But I expect that you will mention it later. Well, uh, it is. I mean, I'm not. I think I'm actually not going to go very far in that direction, um, because I, I, in this talk, because I, I, I want to tell a different story. Um, it's, but it's only true that, that this. Yes, I mean, any coherent topos, right? I mean, this is. You could, um, but, yeah, I don't know. As I said, I don't really know how to make use of that. Um, uh, I mean, if, if I'm interested in actual. Uh, in theory, in, in, in particular concrete theories, rather than just abstract, abstract theories. Okay, so let me, let me go back to my example of exponential fields. Um, so remember what we're talking about. We're talking about a field, it's going to have characteristic zero, and it has this homomorphism from the additive group to the multiplicative group. Let me introduce a little bit more technology uh, terminology. So the field itself could be algebraically closed. So just the underlying field. And if so, we'll, let's call this an EA field, just as a piece of terminology. So E for exponential, A for algebraically closed. Okay. So, and then the next observation we need, if we take the theory of exponential fields and the language of exponential rings, it is an inductive theory. Okay, so we can find these exponent, uh, existentially closed models. Now, um, here's a lemma which um, says that if we do this, we get away from our first for, from our examples. So if we have an existentially closed E field, so E C for existentially closed E for exponential field. Um, then the field itself is algebraically closed, and uh, the kernel, the, the, the kernel of the exponential map, has the same cardinality as the field itself. So the proof is quite easy, but I won't. Um, the the part that the field is uh, algebraically closed, um, you, you can probably do. Um, uh, and the, let me just give the idea for for this part. So if you take any non-zero element of your field, you can build an extension B satisfying this, that there exists an X, that E to the X is one, so X is in the kernel, but E to the X squared is A. Right, so what this gives you is, um, which way does it go? It, uh, well, from this you can build, um, uh, it's only a correspondence between the kernel and the and the whole field that you could you can you can end up building injective functions in both directions. So um, 
So it's so. <clears throat> so in particular, um, these fields here are, are not existentially closed as exponential fields because their kernels are small, countable, uh, and the fields are uncountable. Now, in the past, I have done lots of work around this the complex exponential, and I'm still working on it. But this is a different story. This is an algebraic. That, so basically, if you work here, you have to do analysis. But I, I want to tell uh, an algebraic story to an algebra seminar. So let's see what, what you can do with the algebra. So this is the work with um, Levon uh, Heikashian. Uh, on these exponentially closed E fields. And so I, I, so we need a little bit of algebraic geometry here, not very much, but the notion of what is a variety at least. So um, I'm not sure how familiar this audience is with these ideas. So let me just say a little bit about what it is. So when I say a sub variety, what do I mean? I mean, a, I mean a set of polynomial equations in some variables for additive coordinates and some variables, so X is for additive coordinates and Y is for multiplicative coordinates. So we've got X's and Y's over here. And this V is just some list of polynomial equations between these things with coefficients from our field. And um, what, we're going to say that variety is additively free if the additive coordinates, the x's, don't satisfy any equation that says that um, some linear combination of those is fixed, where the linear, um, uh, where the, where the scalars come from the integers or the rationals. Okay, so there's so why is that important? Well, it's important because the exponential map is a homomorphism. So if we do have this sort of equation holding on V, that's going to give a constraint on the values of the image. Um, so there'll be some corresponding multiplicative relation on the, on the, on the Y's. So we don't want that. Uh, but if we don't have that, then um, in fact, here's the theorem. If you take uh, an uh, sorry, an E field is existentially closed, even only if for every additively free variety V, there is an A um, such that A and E to the A is, is in V. So any system of equations which uh, might have a solution because, um, well, in some extension, all, all already does. That's the idea. And the only possible constraint is, is this one that's actually pretty immediate from just the fact that this exponential is a homomorphism. So that's, so that's actually not so hard to prove with that idea, but it was well, still not, not, not immediately obvious because uh, we, we weren't thinking about it that way. Um, Okay, so uh, one of the things we can do with this, um, with this idea, is uh, we can prove this lemma. So if F is an existentially closed exponential field, then any element uh, in F is an integer, even only if it satisfies um, this this condition here. So. Uh, so we had this before. This is a, the same definition as the integers in the complex exponential field. So for all x, if x is in the kernel, then a times x is also in the kernel. So the proof uh, here is completely different from the proof in the complex numbers. But uh, one of the, the direction I explained before is, is the same, but the, the other direction is, is different, but it, it's, not, it's quite a short proof using this theorem, this characterization. So it's five lines or something. Okay, so notice that this, this is not um, a positive formula. It's not a coherent formula uh, because we have a universal quantification and, and, and an implication, and this is uh, not allowed. Okay, uh, and uh, 
indeed that it shows that this class of EC exponential fields is not first order axiomatizable. Because if you have a first order class and the compactness theorem tells you that sort of a definable set like this, set defined by a formula, um, if it's infinite, it can be as large as you like. You can find another model where it's bigger. And this isn't allowed to grow. It's the same in all existentially closed exponential fields. Okay, so this is um, um, so that that's the basic idea of, of the axiomatization. What else did I say I wanted to do in, in in model theory? Well, we can we we want to understand where these things lie in the stability hierarchy. So I'm going to tell you the answer. I'm not going to tell you really about about the the method for getting there. It is related to is independence notions, which I know um, Yuji and Mike have, have worked on. But you know, there's only time for so much of the story in one seminar. So this is where they lie. They lie in this NSOP1 setting here. And the way, as I said, the way we prove that is we come up with this sort of independence notion. It generalizes the notion of linearly in, linear independence in a vector space and also the notion of algebraic independence from a, from a field, we get an exponential independence and we prove it satisfies certain properties. And if you have such a thing, it says you must be uh, in this bit of the, the, um, uh, the, the map here. And then the other thing we can prove so this, this is, so this is NSOP1, not the strict order property of the first kind. So it's a good property uh, and therefore it has an N at the beginning because Shellach named these properties and he only named the bad properties. On the other hand, there is a bad property it does have, which is called TP2, the tree property of the second kind. And uh, the tree property, it does have that. So it is, um, uh, it's, so it, yeah, sorry, NTP2 is, is this bit. So it is to the right of this line uh, because it does have a tree property. So we can find this combinatorial configuration TP2 and show that it's, it's to the right of that. Okay, so um, I have a couple of slides about uh, types uh, and amalgamation, but I think maybe for this audience, I've, I've, I've got to the end of what I, what I, can, what I can say. So, I think I should stop there and give you a chance to, to ask questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks Thanks very much. So our usual silent round of applause. Or, uh, and um, yeah, so if, thanks for a nice talk. And if anyone would like to ask a question, please go ahead or as a comment. Yes, this was very useful because certainly it gives very concrete situations where we can try to apply this our categorical mechanism. So, so thank you for, for explaining this to us. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think I, I tried to focus a bit more on the on the big picture and the and the, and the example rather than. Um, and how they link together rather than doing too much of the technical things. Uh, I know I, I wanted to tell the story about the independence relation as well, but I feel it, it's, I, I couldn't fit it in. Because in this your historical survey, probably also about positive logic. So maybe one should mentioned this Mackay Pare book because what you call H inductive or so these are coherent sequences and yes it was in some of, I don't know what was the history of that but that was quite important for flexible categories. Right, yes. Um yeah I, I I don't know very much about it. I mean I I I picked out the things that I could find quickly in the in the history, but I'm sure there's a lot that I'm missing. Yeah. Uh, 
Any further uh, comments or questions? Well, if not, then let's thank Jonathan again for a nice talk. Thank you very much. Uh, and hopefully we can have some more uh, model theory related talks in the, in the future. So if anyone has any suggestions, feel free to let me know. Um, and next week we have Yirji uh, Adamek will be talking about joint work, I think, with Yirji Wazitsky about metric type varieties or uh, if I can't remember the title off the top of my head, but it's that, that sort of thing. Uh, okay, so. Um, well, just let me to say that, that I would love to have more modern theoretical talks here, maybe going to some details which your students did. So maybe sometimes in the future, you mentioned some of these simple theories and that. Oh. Yeah, uh, well, uh, my student Mark Hamsmer is here in the audience, so uh, <laughs> he knows more about this as well. Um, I, I will send you my slides. Uh, I send John my slides. I, I do have a few more slides that I didn't, um, uh, that I knew I wouldn't have time to cover. So I, I can, you know, you can have a look at those as well. Um, certainly, if, you, if you're interested, I'm happy to talk about it at a later date. I mean, you know, personally, rather than necessarily giving a seminar uh, as well. Okay, well, uh, that's, that sounds great. So um, thanks a lot. So we can stop recording.